We have so many seating options. <laughs> Could be on top or? All right, you saw it here first, broken leg at IndieCade. Um, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I could sit at your feet. <laughs> no. Okay. All right, I don't think they came here for this. Um, all right, well, uh, it's really exciting to be here with you today, Bernie. That was a great introduction by Tracy, and we want to thank IndieCade for um, being IndieCade and, and making events like this possible. What really excites me, Bernie, about having you here and being able to talk to IndieCade uh, designers, developers, game players, game fans, is that I think yesterday we saw Steve Russell, who's here in the audience, um, who was you know, instrumental in the kind of technological history and also design history of, of uh, computer games, digital games, video games, whatever one wishes to call them. We were just arguing about that or discussing it uh, right before the session. Um, but I think that your work shows a kind of parallel history in the same time period, the, uh, you know, particularly in the late 60s, early 70s, and, and, and since then, that is also incredibly influential, um, less on the technological side and more on uh, the side of design, of thinking about play and games, play communities, playing well, um, that I think is, is, uh, is, is incredibly important, not just for games and game designers and game players in general, but particularly relevant to um, IndieCade and the idea of independent, experimental, unusual, innovative, strange, bizarre, wonderful games that are different than uh, the way we might normally think of a game in operation. So today I hope that we can talk with you, uh, we meeting me and the audience, talk with you a little bit about your history and, and some of the work that you've done, some of the ideas that you've had, and um, how it relates to games and play today. Um, so um, the quotes that I have up occasionally um, above our heads, floating above our heads, uh, are from Bernie's work, The Well-Played Game. Did you all have a chance to read that one? <laughs> yeah, super fast. that good? I I'm said that. <laughs> The last one. Yeah. Oh. Oh, not yes. That, oh, this one. Yes. Yes. No, I like. I use graffito. Graffito. <laughs> 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 All right. Don't get too pleased with yourself. <laughs> I'm here to keep him in line too. You know. Um, so, um, that, why don't you talk a little bit about how you started? I mean, what w what were some of the earliest ways? What's your background, and how did you get involved in play and games? Okay, this can get long, so you'll just you know. When I fall asleep, you know that yeah, it's okay. gone too long. Um, uh, I had a master's degree in theater. I'm so home here. And um, I was hired by the school district of Philadelphia to write a curriculum in children's theater. And that was because it was at a period of, a very brief period of time where the government was giving money to education. <laughs> it's a program called Title I. People were building large scale. Do you remember that, Steve? <laughs> was that it was kind of during your time as well. And he, and it was just it was phenomenal because there were some beautiful things going on. Wonderful teachers that really cared about education were being supported by their caring. Anyhow, they asked me to to they had built this um, in a factory. They had built a school called the Intensive Learning Center. Very exciting and attractive, right? Intensive learning. Oh, I want to go there. That sounds like fun. And, and they hired me to write a curriculum, and they had built also a theater, a beautiful uh, theater in the round uh, on risers, big carpeted risers, parquet wood floor, a, 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 a lighting booth behind with enough lighting to, you could have lit half of the city, I believe, or at least Culver City, maybe. Anyhow, we had all that access to us. And I started uh, um, playing with the kids, teach, with doing what I thought was teaching them theater. My, my real focus, however, wasn't to teach them theater as much as it was to find out what they thought theater was. What was, what, what, did they have any equivalent of theater that they actually pursued and, and shared and created together? That was my real, my real question. And I started out uh, doing improvs pretend you're a bag of potato chips and 
you know, when one of you was going stale. I don't know. We were doing these, <laughs> these Im you know. <laughs> and, they, and they were sweet about it. You know, they, they played it and they tried it and, and they, they liked it. They used to call me Mr. Drama and they actually kind of <laughs> came in on time. And Gotta remember that one. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but I realized that as soon as I would, if I had to walk out of the room to get a phone call or something, the, the whole thing, would, and I came back, the whole thing would just fall apart. They were just, you know, it, it was like they were doing it for me. That's what I felt. And, and so ultimately it became my test of whatever it was that I brought to them. Could they, could I walk out of the room for two minutes and come back in and discover that they were doing the same thing? So eventually I found a book called Improvisation for the Theater by Viola Spolin. A wonderful book. You should you should really, especially the first part of it called the Seven Laws of Spontaneity. Really powerful stuff. And uh, and she taught theater by games. And I tried that for quite some time, and that was that was better. But I still didn't get from the kids the kind of I couldn't walk out of the room. It was like they would stop. To, it was dependent on like an external uh, leader all the time. And the kids didn't really connect with the kids. So really about, this was about five months into it, I got pretty desperate and I said, look, is there anything that you would actually want to do? And the first time I said this is to a group of uh, first graders. And they said, yes. And I said, cool, what would you want to do? And they said, we want to play Duck, Duck, Goose. Well, I was not aware of the theatrical qualities of Duck, Duck, Goose at that time. <laughs> However, if that's what they wanted to do, I said, okay, well, sure, if you want to play Duck, Duck, Goose, you know, I, don't, I didn't know the game, I didn't remember it, and if you want to play it, go ahead and play it, and I'll watch. And they started playing it, and I, I walked out of the room for two minutes and came back in, and they were still playing it. And then I walked out of the room for five minutes and came back in, and they were still playing it. And it was natural that they'd be playing it because it was a big circular space, so it kind of said, play Duck, Duck, Goose on it at least in their perspective. So I thought, all right, I'm halfway there. This is something that they want to do. Um, but it didn't, it, it just didn't feel Shakespearean to me. And I, <laughs> and I was imagining, you know, talking to the superintendent about the theatrical qualities of Duck, Duck, Goose. And, and then they invited me to come and play with them. And I sat down, because we were playing the sitting down version. There's also the standing up version, which is, better but because of sitting down you have to stand up to play it and it's awful that you hear it. Uh, and, um, and I started realizing once I was got into the game of, of that actually was very theatrical. That, I mean, suppose you don't want to be chosen. You're sitting in the circle and you do not want to be chosen. Well, you have to manifest your invisibility. Unless, of course, the guy who's out there is looking for people who are trying to look invisible, <laughs> right? Then you have to say, oh, pick me, oh, God, oh, please pick me, oh, please pick me. Unless, of course, the person, <laughs> so, there's, so there's like a lot of tension around being chosen. And, uh, and then the person on the outside, how do they decide whom to choose? Do you choose the best runner so you have a good challenge? Do you choose your friend? Do you choose somebody you really hate and that you want to beat? And and the more I the more I played it with them, the more I realized that yes, this is there is something. There's a dramaturgy here. They're telling a story here about getting chosen. It's kind of very much like raising your hand in, in class. You know, do you want to get chosen? Do you want do you want the teacher to call on you, or do you want to look like you know but not get called on? Or and that was the first time that you had really in a sense, let's say, took games seriously or took a serious look at games. I mean, I obviously, you had played games growing up and oh other, yeah. other oh yeah, definitely. chapters definitely. of your life. But well, you I, no, I liked, I, I mean, I did like to play a lot. And, uh, but it was, yeah, it was the first time that I saw that games were a lot bigger than I thought they were. See, what interests me about the way you talk about Duck, Duck, Goose is that you see the game context as a place where there's a, a deep engagement but not necessarily the way that we might talk about video games today. Not because, you, you say there's a story there and there's drama there, but it's not that there's a, 
designer-created story. It's that it is a kind of a human story that has to do with the presentation of the self in the context of well, who Duck, designed, Duck, Goose. Well, somebody designed Duck, Duck, Goose. Right. Well, it's a folk game, right? So, so it's there were folk around that designed <laughs> the game. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, you know, I mean, a lot of good games get that. I mean, that's the fate of a lot of wonderful games. Right. Chess, checkers, what have Who designed checkers? You know? Right. And, and, that, and I think that's the hope of a lot of game designers, yeah. that their work becomes folk yeah, culture. absolutely. Let, let, let's, let's transition a little bit. This is an image from the Games Preserve. Uh, so oh, you're, so your, yes. your work shifted gradually from working with kids to working with Can adults. Can I tell you how that happened? Yeah, please. Most amusing. So... Um, I didn't get to talk about hot bread and butter, which I really want to okay, talk about. Okay, let's talk about hot bread and butter. Do you mind? No. no. You don't know what it is, but you don't care because. Okay, so because this was, the, this was the pivotal point in my really understanding of the theater of games was that I tried the same thing, and the fifth grade kids came in, and they were not interested in playing Duck, Duck, Goose. They, I, so I said, all right, is there a game that you want to play? And they said, yes, there is, as a matter of fact. We want to play hot bread and butter. Okay, hot bread and butter. So how do you play hot bread and butter? Well, the first thing you need is a belt. <laughs> this immediately caused concern. <laughs> uh, was this an objective correlative of which they were speaking? I, I wasn't sure. And so I said, uh, why do you need a belt? So we, so we can hit people with it. <laughs> and then I went, because uh, I had a little place with junk in it, and I went and I got a boffer, which is a big foam rubber sword, and I said, wouldn't you rather play with this, because it's so much, it's so loud, and you can hit people really hard, and it doesn't hurt? No. <laughs> no, it has to be a belt. So I tried a few things, and then finally, I gave up, and it was a belt, and then I said, all right, all right, look. First of all, raise your hand if you want to play. Everybody raised their hand. Then I said, okay, look, if you don't want to play, just in case somebody felt you can go over and I and I should and I claim that particular area as a non-play area, just a hangout and watch area, because I wanted them to to feel safe. Safety is a very important thing about play. You can't play if you don't feel safe. Um, so so um, they got together. So this is how you play it. So you get together and you're you're all at the at your at, at the home base. And one kid, and then you close your eyes and hum so you can't hear anything. And one kid goes out and hides the belt somewhere. Comes back to the circle and yells, hot bread and butter, come and get your supper. <laughs> Everybody runs as fast as possible trying to find the belt. The person with the belt gets to hit everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> now, first, first of all, I, lo I love how that, that game is so mythic. It's almost it like the absolutely. the the Ur game. This is yeah. This it's is like well, well, we're we're gonna hide the the object of power. That's right. Right, which which you are gonna go out and find yes. that gives you the ability yes. to to beat the other players who uh. weren't weren't lucky or skillful enough or clever enough to find it. Now, now, not only that, well sp well spoken, very <laughs> clearly, but not only that, but. The fact is that they, the fact that they called it home, I thought, was kind of significant, the, where they were safe. The fact that they had to leave home in order to find the power. And it was a choice that they made. And it was a choice because they didn't have to. They just wouldn't get the belt. But they wouldn't get hit either. And they had to leave home, and, when, and, and they, had to, they had to take the risk. And they're fifth grade kids. And what's going on in their lives? I mean, this was like beyond metaphor. This was, this was, like I said, it's dramaturgy. It really, it's a, it's a, a way of describing a human condition that is that is profoundly relevant. I, I, I came to understand really that all play that kids do is in a way helping them deal with things that they can't really deal with yet. They play with them, and by playing with them, they become familiar and they have mastery over the... Th There's a great story that uh, a woman named uh, Sara Simolonsky wrote about kids playing in a... In a uh, they were in a playground in a kindergarten and um, nursery school, and uh, there was a terrible accident right, out, right outside of the nursery school, and the whole... Everybody in the playground came to watch what happened. 
And then for the next three weeks, they were playing ambulance. And it's just, I mean, it's, it was there. I really, that was really solid evidence to me that, these, that that's what play is doing, not only for kids, but I think for all of us. It's allowing us to, and that's why, I, you know, I don't, I don't think violent games are wrong because this is, we have to, violence is extremely difficult for us to integrate as a, as a thing in our lives. And violent games give us a chance in some ways to kind of begin to accept that violence is real in our lives. And when you say violent, you mean both physically um, active games as well as games that might use representations or metaphors for Absolutely. violence. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, y so, so for you, this was relevant not just for kids, but for adults. So and you, yeah. it didn't really become relevant for adults for me until I went to teach. So I had written the curriculum. It was a thousand children's games in five volumes. Extremely impressive. That's what they really liked about the curriculum. The school district is, look, the five-volume curriculum. And so, you know, it's a, it, and all the teachers wanted it because it would look so good on their bookshelves. And, um, and it's out of print now? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We need to get, we need to get that online, open source, baby. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thousand anyhow. games by Bernie DeCoven. Anyhow. Well, I, I, I you know, I, I did Collected a lot of and research and modified. theater games. And, and um, um, so, so... Right after I finished the curriculum, my next thing was to start disseminating it and teaching it to teachers. And the first class that I taught, I had maybe 30 teachers, uh, and we had 45 minutes. And I brought, uh, I had a plan of teaching them eight different games because these eight games were representative of different ways that kids play. Uh, because games have different structures, as you know. You know, there's games where everybody's for himself, there's games where you're on your team, there's games where you're in a group, there are games where there's an individual in a group and a group in a team and a team in a So I wanted them to see it and I started with Duck Duck Goose because I thought it would be innocuous and they could play it for three minutes and then go on to the next minute. 45 minutes later they were still playing Duck Duck Goose. Despite all of my encouragement to say, didn't we learn the game? Isn't it clear? Isn't it wonderful? Wouldn't you like to try something else even more fun? No, I haven't had my turn yet. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that was when I realized that, that, that this, really, this stuff is really as relevant for adults as it is for kids. So I, we proverbially bought the farm. And uh, it was 25 acres. It was outside of Philadelphia, uh, near Reading. And uh, what you're seeing there is what happened after about three years it took is us. Is that you in the foreground, by the that way? That is me in the foreground. And that's Rocky, my wife, coming down the steps. Nice. And uh, so this is the ins inside of a big 40 by 40 bank barn, beautiful old stone. And that was just, that was the, the big indoor facility. I, ha I realized. Some stylish specs on there, uh, yes. Bernie. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and a leather b uh, thingy there. Anyhow. Uh, <laughs> What do they call those hats? I don't know. Train engine. Well, I don't know. Anyhow, so um, so the I, I realized that if I wanted to give adults a sense, uh, a permission to play, I had to I had to give them many objects, because you, it, it's it's much more difficult for them to organize uh, explorations of new ways of playing without having like I mean I couldn't walk out of the room. I couldn't. I I had to be there always to make them feel safe. I wanted to give them a space where they would feel safe. And there would be enough games in there so that no matter, no ma will you stop nodding your head, Tracy? Because now I'm always looking at you and I can't <laughs> stop. <laughs> so, I, I mean. So that was, yes. so I had to create, a, oh, it's not, the games reserve is gone. You want, you no, no, are we ready to move that? You understand what the games reserve was and why I did that? Well, I, I think that, I mean, one of the ideas about the games reserve, that the games reserve embodies for me that comes out of your work is the idea of a play community, right? That it's, that it's not necessarily the, the primary unit that we might think about games and play is not necessarily a, a player or even a game, but rather the community that comes when those things intersect with each Absolutely. other. Absolutely. And that was also what I was discovering with the kids, that the, play, the community of play was the thing that kept the game together. That was what was important. And I have a... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly what I was going to say. Read that. I'm not going to say anything. And that, and and through your work in the games reserve, is how you initially connected with the new games movement. That's right. So I was I was actually teaching people not only uh, about play, but also about how to how to facilitate play, how to create communities of play, 
And uh, at that time, there was an organization in mostly in San Francisco uh, that had um, they uh, they were doing these very large scale play events. Now it was not. And I just want to make it very clear, these were not just cooperative games. For some reason, that became the history. They were not just cooperative games. We played some, some wonderful games. In fact, it started out really as what uh, Stuart Brand called soft war. And it was really all about, you know, soft war, that's where the earth ball came from. He took military kinds of games that were played in the military as training and adapted them, not very much, and brought them right into the... And Stuart, Stuart Brand was the sort of, um, uh, in the late 60s, he was a sort of um, impresario. He founded the Whole Earth Catalog, very active politically and culturally. Yes. In a, and a, along a whole range of vectors. Absolutely. Yeah, a remarkable person. He just started the New Games Foundation and left. All he wanted to do was to see it happen. And it was kind of like a, a, a way of talking, of, uh, of demonstrating a, a different way of, it was like, it was Vietnam at that time, and all the all the demonstrations tended to be, except for the Bians the, and the and the the Singins and those kind of things, they were pretty violent and and confrontative. And he wanted, he believed, like I like I came to believe, that playing in public itself is a political act. I mean, if you just having fun, in fact, in many places, just laughing out loud is a political act, because it's like. It's, it's forbidden. It's, you're not supposed to do it. You don't laugh at a museum. You don't laugh at work. You, even laughing in, uh, outside in the crosswalk is like, you must be, there must be something wrong with you. So actually playing a game in public is like, is a political act. And that's what we were doing. So we were playing these games. They were competitive games. They were cooperative games. Uh, there's a couple images from games up here now from the... Ah, uh, yes. So that, that bottom game is, was called the lap game. Um, and uh, you can figure out why. And uh, we had, we had the, I think our record was over 3,000 people um, sitting in a big lap. And it's important to note, uh, you, you can't really see it too well here, but a lot of times people just fell right off the lap and it <laughs> didn't really matter that much. It, what mattered is that we all tried and the contact and that sense of safety, uh, I mean, it just was really remarkable because that person behind you was in fact there to hold you, and and you were doing the same thing for that person. So, it, so it created this this physical experience of community and lots of laughter because you knew you were going to fall. If you didn't fall, then we went to the next phase, where we started saying, "Okay, let's all see if we can walk around." <laughs> and if that still worked, then we said, "Okay, now reach across as much as you can to the other person on the other side." And sooner or later, everybody would fall because that also was mm -hmm. failure is as much part of the fun experience as success. You know, it's which so anyhow. So we played cooperative games. We played competitive games. We had we had games from Aikido and uh, and I introduced some cooperative games and I introduced some competitive games and and uh, but what they really wanted from me uh, was um, a way to. I like what they were doing, but what they really needed is is a way to teach other people how to facilitate what they had created. And I, and I have to say, Bernie, one of my great play experiences in my life was when at, at the recent DIGRA conference, I met you in person for the first time, and and you led a new games workshop, and I got to see how it is that you teach people how to play a game. I'm, I was brilliant. One of the. <laughs> Well, one, but, of the things that I'm, one of the things that I'm learning as a game designer is that, you know, there's a lot of ways we can frame what a game designer is. We, ha we have to balance systems, we can tell stories, we can, you know, make social commentary, but we're also educators, especially the kind of indicate style games. When, when you make a game that has an unusual, weird mechanic that you have to ease the player into, introduce them to, you have to, the, the moment of, of how you teach someone a game is such an incredible part of being a game designer. So that was, I got a lot of great tips from you for both for my digital and my non-digital work, watching you watching you teach games. As a footnote, uh, the the what we say in new games, what we said was play hard, play fair, nobody hurt. When we played, only one person got hurt. Oh, <laughs> that was a self-inflicted wound, oh, I, man. I believe. He is such an enthusiastic player. It was so much fun to watch him play. And that was, you know, as a facilitator play, that's what happens to you because you feel 
the energy of the group that you're creating, and you just get better and better as the group has more and more fun. I now, um, do you guys think that we could encourage Bernie to 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 teach us one game that we might play here in the room? No. Yes, yes. I think if we ask him very nicely, Bernie, something I I, I think it would be great I didn't to hear experience. Anybody ask me for? I heard you. All right, one more time. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, I have to play. This is going to be, I've never done it this way. This is a game that I've never played this way before. So, but, <coughs> but I play this a lot in new games, one variation or another. It's basically rock, scissors, paper. Um, but um, it, was, it was originally, I, I first learned it as a, uh, a Spanish game, El Tigre, El Tigre, eh, El Hombre y El Fusil. Did that make sense to anybody who speaks Spanish? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Two out of three is not bad. The guy and the fusil, the gun. Ah, tiger man, gun, rock, paper. Tiger is like the rock, and the gun is like the, you know, it's a rock, scissors, <laughs> paper thing. And 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 the, can I not use my microphone so I can gesture? Is that all right? Uh, what? You know, I'll hold your one and I. So so. It's a game of. Hey, uh, uh, yeah, I can project. Hey, I can project. <laughs> <laughs> can you hear me up there? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so there are. There are. So, so it's a physical game, a physical manifestation. It's a whole body rock paper scissors, right? So the tiger. So you tell everybody, okay, you're gonna be a tiger, and the tiger goes. That everybody goes. That. And then you say, okay, now you're going to be a man. Anyhow, that doesn't matter because I changed it. And later on, <laughs> the other about it became the panther, the porcupine, and the person. And after that, so it doesn't really matter. What, what matters is, is that you have three different things. And each one has a position and a sound. And that, you just, and that you know ahead of time, can you still hear me? I'm yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you know ahead of time, you decide, you have to decide what beats what. So, okay, so the marshmallow beats the chicken coop, the chicken coop beats the pasta, and the pasta beats the marshmallow. That's the idea. Of course, the problem with that, the challenge would be, how do you look like a pasta and make a noise like a pasta? And that's part of what you have. Right. So, so, now, there are three consequences that can happen, right? The rock could be the paper, the paper could be the solution, or you could tie. Now, I introduced the rule that if you tie, you hug each other and say, oh. <laughs> okay, so that, that's basically the structure. Now, now, what you have to do, if, if you want to try this, is, and you have to figure it out, you have to get together in group. You can play this in three teams if you want, or two teams. I thought maybe you could play with the people behind you and see if you can, you know, because it would be if you have to stand up. But I'm not telling you how to do it. You can do it any way you want. You can play with at least one person, but it's actually a team game. So if you have like a whole bunch of people on your team and you make, have to make a decision together what to be next, it's very cute and fun and thrilling. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 Let's hear some examples of what you guys came up with. Uh, who wants to share what the, the three things they had? Yeah, over here. We had rocket ships, kookaburra, and Bernie de Coven. <laughs> and what did a Bernie look like? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, how about another group? Yeah. We had uh, uh, car, car, traffic, traffic possum. and possum. Whoa. <laughs> Could you, you want to manifest your trafficness or your possum? Uh -oh. I love LA. <laughs> All right, what? Uh, yeah. We did um, Donkey Kong smashes Sonic. Sonic outruns Mario, and Mario defeats Donkey Kong. Whoa. Did you have sounds for all of them? Uh, yeah, Sonic goes. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> nice, nice. Also, one of the things I love about this version is that the tie, which usually is the dead space in rock, paper, scissors, with a hug becomes like the climax of the game. You know, what's interesting is you can... Is you can it becomes more about like, oh, we had a mind meld yeah. and we achieved so the same thing. So it's actually more fun. It's yeah. a, or at least it's that equal, equally fun to compete as it is to cooperate. Thanks, Eric. Um, so, so, Bernie, what, so I, what, one of the things that's interesting about this is that I, you know, I, I always think about audience games. They have to be elegant and quick and you have to get into them quickly. First of all, you spent a very long time coming to the game, right? That's one of the things that, that teaches me about game tutorials and learning a game. If you, do you remember Bernie said, first of all, he basically told you the secret of the game, the first thing, it's rock, paper, scissors, right? So it wasn't as if you saved that as a sort of special surprise. You told us the structure of the game, no hiding that, and then you talked about where it came from, it was originally this, you spent some time making up your own version of Spanish, you, you know, <laughs> explain the game, and then, and then finally when we get to the game, it's, it's, um, you know, I thought, oh, it's too complicated that, you know, we should have told them what to do, divide them into teams. But instead, it was this incredible explosion of creativity and laughter and, and hugging and, and gestures and fuck yous and, you know, the whole thing. So to, to me, it's, anyway, it's, it's really an interesting game that you chose because the players themselves are, are creating content. Yeah, well, that's kind of been the, the, the big discovery of most of my experience with games is that if, that that once you are able to create ownership over the game, then, it, then the players really do take possession. It becomes their game. And that really is the goal. At least it became my goal. I wanted the game to be... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I found a good quote. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I saw everybody was going like that. <laughs> but that, yeah, that, that's basically... So, so, I mean, didn't it feel different that because you... I didn't tell you what to do when you made up your own. There's something about that experience, not because it's a, it, it creates community and celebrates community, but also because you know you get to be inventive together and silly together and and. But but here's the thing: when we do it with a with a with a sort of a a, a game like this in a setting, and Bernie makes it feel so easy and natural. But but this idea of blurring the lines between designers and players, which you explored in your book, The Well-Played Game. Who has read The Well-Played Game from The Well-Played Game? Nice. All right, so the rest of you, this is a fundamental book. This is like um, Space War, uh, as Steve Russell's game, Space War, Chris Crawford's book, The Art of Computer Game Design. It is one, that, one of the very first books that really looked at games in a contemporary way. Now, this book came out in 1978, right? Now, that, I just, let's just set the scene. That was you know, after Space War, but really before the, the, the rise of video games as a mass cultural media in the, in the 1980s. This is before, obviously, the internet, before um, um, uh, personal computers were so prevalent. This is before cable television uh, existed. I mean, this is... So you had to turn the knob on the right. TV. Right. <laughs> so this is very early, but, but the, the, the ideas in this book, there are, one of the exciting things about this book is that it's so prescient to me. Uh, every time I, I take a look at this book, I am astounded by the things that we debate about now that feel very much present and of our time, you explored with, in great rigor and detail in, in the Well-Played Game. And in fact, we, uh, Bernie and I want to announce that the Well-Played Game is being republished. Is that right? By that MIT Press. Yes. So... Anyway, congratulations on that, and it, it's, great that they're, it's great that they're republishing the book. But this idea, for example, um, by the way, I love this cover. I, this was my favorite. Is this the or, or, or original, or this was the first paperback edition? That was the first paperback. Yeah, yeah. I love that. I love that, uh, love that cover. Um, the, the, this idea of blurring the line between players and designers, now we call that user-generated content. We might call it... Um, you know, the, a play-centric idea of, 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 of games or, or modding games and, or hacking into games. But this is a, you saw this as a fundamental quality of play itself. Um, and I, 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 to, me it's, to me, it's kind of a mind-blowing a mind um, uh, uh, transition. Now, I want to go a little bit deeper into some of the ideas of um, the well-played game. And one of them, yes, yeah, so now Bernie has to... <laughs> Um, I want to, I want to, this, this for example is Bernie talking about volleyball. And actually, the, the interesting thing about the well-played game is that Bernie goes quite deep into a number of games. Some of them are sports, 
Some of them are, are, are games like marbles or tic-tac-toe. And it's not just giving lip service to the general notion of how we change a game. There are stories about how you, uh, starting with a game of, of ping pong, which I think is interesting because pong, you know, again, one of the first video games, tennis for two. Um, and, um, or computer games or digital games, whatever you want to call them. Or analog games in the case of tennis for two. I remember that from your lecture last night. Um, it's a minefield up here. So, um, uh, uh, but I think that, um, so, so, so uh, uh, your book is just full of these wonderful, fairly rigorous examples of, of how it is that, how it is that we can play. But one of, the, one of the really fascinating things about your book is that you really look at play and game. And I think today, again, in our contemporary design discourse, sometimes there's actually a divide. There's those almost two camps of people. Um, in the last few years, there are people who, let's call them more from the ludology tradition, classical game designers, people interested in rules, people interested in telling stories that designers author that really focus on games and game design and rules. And then there's another camp, people that are more interested in play. Maybe they're sociologists uh, or, or social science type people. Maybe they're more kind of political activists that feel that they need to empower players. Right? Or maybe they're just people that want to do more wild, player, creativity-driven games. But the amazing thing about your book is that it's really, in my mind, a kind of a, the, the kind of missing link between these two ideas. Because you always see them, like in the quote that we have up here, that, that they're, they're kind of two sides of the same coin or two aspects of this idea of playing well. So what, what does it mean to play well, the well-played game? Well, I was... Uh I was really struck by the fact that you could be, you could have people competing in a game um, and at the end of the game look at each other and say, boy, that was a good game. And they would say that, I mean, the losing team would say that with equal vigor as the winning team. And they weren't, they weren't talking about who won, they were talking about the quality of the experience that they created together. And, and I came to understand that that's what competition is really all about, that it drives people. It's, out, you know, the, the d it's very hard to make a single-player game, but when you have a two-player game, you have an opponent that can constantly give you variations, give you change, give you new challenge, right? And that's, that's kind of the... Now, when you can transcend the competition and appreciate the way that you play... I found later, after I wrote the book, there was this... Bill Russell, who was the Celtics, captain of the Celtics basketball team. See, I knew that, about basketball and Celtics. <laughs> uh, he wrote a book called um, uh, Second Wind, Memoirs of an Opinionated Man. And he talks about experiences of playing. He, one of the things he talks about is there he was, they were playing for, what did they get? Um, it's not a Heisman and it's not a pennant. They get something else in, ba in basketball. Anyhow, he was playing for that. It was like it was, you know, the, the crucial, one of the crucial games. And they were beating the, the, the opponents by about 30 points. And he wrote, he said, I couldn't help but feeling disappointed that the other team wasn't playing better. The whole game started feeling not good to me. That we lost our connection with each other. We lost our connection with the team, with the other team. We lost our connection with the, with the spectators. We just, it just, I mean, yeah, we won, but what did we win? It wasn't, it wasn't fun. I mean, that's, that guy, that's his, his reputation, his fame, the success of his team he's talking about and saying, gee, it really wasn't a good game. And that's when I, that, those kinds of things help me understand after I wrote the book, what I was writing the book about. So it's, yeah, so what, what, what's fascinating to me is that you would think by all of your writing about play community and, and, and players becoming designers and modifying games that you would fall on the side of this sort of play-centric, de-emphasizing competition, de-emphasizing game rules, but you have, you know, but, but it's really not true that your book has such a strong balance you, you look at competitive games, you look at the role of spectators, you look at the role of referees and halftimes and prologues and, and, and tournament structures and coaches um, and how they all play an important role in competitive games. Um, but there's a, there's a distinction I make uh, in com competitive games which I think might be useful. Uh, it's a little chapter that I call Playing to Win 
versus having to win. You don't happen to have that, do you? Something to that <laughs> ilk. <laughs> yes. So, because that's, th that, that's, where, that's where the thing starts breaking down. So competition. Here, here it is. Here's the quote about playing to win and having to win. <laughs> All right. I knew it was in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> because competition ceases to be uh, a source of play when the people are playing, uh, when people are so focused on winning that, that the fun disappears. You know, I mean, it, I, it just drives me crazy when, when a kid comes home and the father says, so did you win? You know, they come home from a little league game or something like that. I mean, they don't talk about the quality of the game. They don't talk about what was really fun for you in the game and when did you feel best about your play and how and your team and how about the other team? How did it's just like what was the score? So that that creates an environment where the where where having to win becomes the driving force. And if you have to win, then you get into what I call tournamentality. Because you can never win. If you have to win, you will never win. And I, I think that, Bernie, that, that makes me think about really what games are for you and what is the, let's not say the benefit, but what's the, what's the reason that people play, right? I, I mean, I think that this idea of playing for its own sake is fascinating. And today, it was interesting because for many decades, games were vilified as being by, too violent, or kid stuff, or trivia, or junk food, or you know, causing kids to look at television too much, then suddenly in the last few years, there's been a weird reversal, where games are often heralded now as how we're going to save schools, or how we're going to you know, teach people about poverty, or how we are going to you know, eliminate the technology gap between genders, or between e socioeconomic classes. And so suddenly games are seen as a sort of savior, the silver bullet that's gonna save the world. But I find that your work has a good balance between both of those things, that you're not necessarily interested in games as saving the world. You're more interested in games as a context for personal growth. Is, would, would you agree the way I put that? Personal community growth, um, the evolution of the spirit. Um, right now, I've been talking more about fun than about games or play, because I think fun is, that's, I mean, I don't think we'd play if it wasn't for fun. And I think if you, if you in fact, when I, when I, uh, um, go to a, a, I'm asked to consult to a business and they want to know something like, well, what can you do to make work more fun for us? And I, I say to them, well, can you tell me when work is fun for you? Just, just any occasion when work is fun? How about a meeting? Were you ever in a meeting that was fun? You know, and, and after a while they start saying, oh yeah. Yeah, we had a meeting that was fun. I remember people <coughs> were so excited. We got so interested in what we had to say. And the ideas were flying. And people were listening to each other with such intensity. And I say, well, that's, you don't have to make work fun. You have to start from where the fun is and make it easier for those things to happen. And I find that idea such a wonderful uh, antidote to the sort of gamification, right, which is the idea of putting the superficial aspects of games on top of other activities. But instead, to me, the well-played game goes so deep into what makes games pleasurable and meaningful on a personal and interpersonal level that then that, that allows us to recognize those qualities in other activities. <coughs> and I think that the best, the best people who are into gamification are able to, to use that game as a way to help people reveal the fun of the thing that's being gamified. You're so diplomatic. For <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think it's true. I think that there are, I, I, I've seen games like that, that actually, simulation games. There's a <coughs> there was a guy uh, who died recently and became a very close friend of mine named Gary Schurz. This will take three minutes, is that okay? Yes. He, uh, maybe, all right, how about five? Can I have one? Uh, then, then maybe we want to go to questions soon. All right, so Gary, Gary Schurz uh, invented a game um, that, um, that was called Star Power. And it was simulation games uh, before the computer came uh, into, uh, uh, was, were uh, made, a, they, they come in a box and you had lots of little things inside and, uh, and lots of instructions. Sometimes it was instructions for the leader was one set of instructions, instructions for the different players was another set of instructions and there were roles and all kinds of. So Gary invented this game called Star Power. And he did it 
um, I don't remember who he did it for. Anyhow, it was, I think it was for the Navy. Um, and in the game, you, there are, uh, you start out with a bunch of chips. And everybody, everybody gets a bunch of poker chips. And then there's, and they, they go and take a random collection of poker chips. And then there's a chart, and it tells you what your poker chips are worth. So if you have three red and two blue, it's worth 12 points. But if you have four red and one blue, it's worth 20 points. And if you have three blue and three red, and it's worth 160 points, I don't know. You, you, but you get my, like poker hands, right? So that was, that's how you start. You gather your chips. And then he says, okay, I want you to gather into three different groups. One group that has the highest points, people that have the high. Second group, people that have the kind of middle points. And the third group, the people that have the fewest points. And then he would say, okay, now we're going to have one more trading round. Just another trading round where you can start trading, round, trading chips with each other. And then we'll see who gets to be in what team, what group after that. And he made a rule for the trading that you go to somebody and you shake their hand and you cannot conclude the meeting until you have made a trade. So you have to keep on holding the guy's hand and say, I'll give you two red for a yellow. What do you think of that? And how about three red for you? Let go of my hand. I'll give you, what do you want? And, <laughs> and so, and then, and then they would redivide into their groups and you'd have three different groups. And then you would say, okay, from now on, the group with the highest power gets to highest chips, gets to change any one rule of the trading that they want to. Just any rule that you want. So what do you think they would do the next round? They would meet and they would talk about changing rules, all three of the teams. The group with the highest started talking about, well, maybe we can make it a little bit harder for the other team. Maybe we can say, um, you have to give us two chips for every one chip that we give you. And maybe we can change the value of their chips to look at our, maybe we can, so that was what they would do. In the meantime, the middle group was started to look, oh, I know what we could do. We could trade our chips with each other and we'll have somebody who has so many points so that he could join the other team. Then the, the low group, they would just kind of talk and party and feel totally disempowered and not care about anything. <laughs> then the third round, and this was kind of the most dramatic for me, in the third round, the people who came for the middle group and got into the top group, they made the most draconian rules of anybody. And, they, and that resulted in the 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 a revolution with the the the, the low power group they started throwing their chips at people this almost happened this i mean uh, it's it, a game that's designed to break down it was a game that was designed to break down absolutely and and but nobody told these people to do what they did to make those decisions no value extrinsic value was placed on having more chips or being in the star group or being in one group or another and he and you and it was shocking to discover your behavior, that you, yourself, so intelligent and gifted, would do such awful things. Right. Now, but here's, here's what's so amazing about the, the games of that era that, that you were involved with, like Star, including Star Power and, and, and other games of yours, um, as well as the ideas in the well-played game, that for me, there are lens for looking at contemporary video games. For example, that incredibly wonderful perverse idea of setting up an online community, for example, like an MMO or a, or a social network community that, 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 that has arbitrary class division, right, and disempowerment and empowerment designed to break down, designed to sort of positive feedback loops to help the people in power, as opposed to the sort of fair level playing field, everyone starts together. That's such a sort of brilliant idea that we haven't seen yet, as far as I know, in, in video games. And there are so many other aspects that we haven't, didn't get to talk to, even, even what you were saying about having to play a game, right? Well, that, that's not even necessarily about competition. There's all kinds of debates today yes. among game designers about the ethics of addiction. Should games be designed with revenue models that, it, that force you to play or force you to bother your friends? So, so all, of this, all of these ideas you explored in the well-played game, again, how many decades ago was that? Um, I'm not a math major, but uh, many, many more decades than, uh, uh, than, you, than one would think. So it's... 
Yes. Five minutes. Okay, so let's I let's you so hand. so I want to so I want to uh, let let's move to questions. But I, Bernie, I just want to thank you for you oh, know Eric, your, it was your really fun. Talking yeah, no, no, your your incredible no, insight no, no, as a no, designer, you're just player. All right. Well, thank you, Bernie DeCoven. Thank you so much.